Ichimon Japan is made possible in part by Patreon support. And I am very happy because there's three new patrons. Thank you so, so much. So thank you to Kiara. Thank you to Kudo and Christine Gilpin. Uh, you guys are helping us pay for um, what we're working on. You know, aside from the hosting and things that I have to spend on for the podcast and the website, you know, now we have a whole bunch of other new expenses with the new YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't heard, we started a uh, kind of documentary youtube channel focused on people doing interesting things in japan it's called japankyo docs so that does cost money i am working on this with kyle from tokyo explosion podcast so all funds are basically being saved up so that we can do a lot of the stuff that we really really want to do we're doing our best with the funds that we have for the time being also thank you so much to tom culbertson and robbie who upped their pledges they were already patrons but decided to give us more and for that we just from the bottom of our hearts thank you thank you thank you thank you if you want to join the patreon you can do so for as little as one dollar a month just head on over to japankyo.com slash patreon sign up over there um you can join for one dollar a month that'll get you early access to podcast episodes occasional bonus content and if you join for three dollars a month you get access to the back catalog of japanese plus alpha that is a podcast that I've been doing on a monthly basis, but I have to put it on indefinite hold for the time being while I work on the YouTube channel. But there are like 16, I think, episodes, maybe a little more, maybe right around there. Um, and they're all focused on just kind of interesting little quirks of the Japanese language. So I think there's at least two hours of content there, if not like three hours, maybe. Um, so interesting stuff there if you join the $3 a month plus alpha tier. Uh, so again, japankyo.com slash Patreon. Thank you for all the support. And let's get the show started. Um, so it looks sailor uniform-ish, but it looks a bit different than, you know, what you most people would think of sailor uniform these days. I do got to say in this photo, she's with a dog. If the uniform came with a dog, I'm changing my vote to Kyoto. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ichimon Japan. I'm Tony and... And I'm Ryan. And we're joined by one of our uh, regular guests, um, Shu. Hello. Welcome back, Shu. Thank you for having me again. Hey, Tony and Ryan yeah. and everyone. How's it going? Great. He's, he's got more energy than us. He's going to, like, upstage us. Oh, uh, th that's because I got my own apartment. And, <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now you can be loud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my father wouldn't be wondering what the hell is this guy doing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, wonderful, wonderful. Let's do it. Good to know. All right. <laughs> so, uh, Ichimon means one question, and every episode uh, we ask a question yeah. about Japan. Today's question is... How's your new apartment? <laughs> How's your new apartment, Shu? Do you like it? <laughs> Expensive. <laughs> Well, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. <laughs> yep, we answered the question. <laughs> Goodbye, guys. Um, no, <laughs> today's question is, what are Buddhama? All right. So this is another one of these episodes where I ask a super specific question, but it's really because I want to talk about a bunch of other stuff. But this super specific question is not enough to fill 45 minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's do it. All this right, is the so Dragon Ball character, right? <laughs> yeah, Buddha, the Dragon Ball character. Yeah, very famous anime character. Um, well, all right. So super short answer. Buddha are these type of shorts. But before we talk about that, um, we're going to talk about school uniforms for the most part. And then we'll get into the Buddha question. So um, I think Japan is pretty famous for its school uniforms. Um, I mean, like the sailor um uniform and the uh what they call the gakudan that kind of like high collared you know the that the boys wear the uniform um and there's there's a lot of like little interesting history and stuff like how did it happen and all that so i wanted to talk a little bit about that first so um well actually you know what let's start with shu so shu um in your school when you were going to school as a student did you have to wear uniforms yes i my school uniform for junior high school was the Gakuran style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in high school, uh, the school didn't have any uniforms. Or I would say I chose the school because the school didn't have uniforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
And actually, Ryan, I think you teach at a high school that doesn't do. School yeah, I teach at too, three right? different ones, and one of them mm-hmm. does not have uniforms. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say that the schools, the high schools that don't have uniforms, are more like high level schools. <laughs> I would say. Hmm. Yeah. Um. I've. I've met a lot of people. I don't know. Maybe I just meet a certain kind of person, but I've met a lot of people that ended up going to high schools in Japan where they don't wear uniforms. So I don't know. I think my sample might be biased, though. <laughs> I think it is a more common thing than people expect, but it is still uh-huh. the minority, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So school uniforms can vary quite a bit from um, school to school even if they do have uniforms, um, you know, and, and of course, like we said, there's exceptions where there's no uniform, but um, let, let's go back into the history a little bit and, and learn where some of these uniforms started. Um, so up until the Meiji period, schools didn't, I mean, up until the Meiji period, there wasn't really like a, a national school system. <laughs> school uniforms so, didn't exist because there were no schools. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like... Yeah, Terakoya, I guess, right? Which are kind of like, uh, kind of like schools at Buddhist temples. Um, More like cram schools. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know, or, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, yeah, but it was not like a formal education system. Um, and then, of course, you know, like, I guess the rich people, they would probably do like private tutoring kind of stuff. You know, they would uh, hire somebody to teach their kids. But yeah, nothing like like now. So it was in the Meiji period when um, they started to do like the whole national school system. And, and um, it was around the 1870s when we start to see kind of the beginnings of um, like kind of more Western style clothing uh, uniform. But from what I can tell, it was either 1886 or 1889. I saw some disagreement in some articles, but um it was that in the latter half of the 1880s when the Tokyo Imperial University started using the uniform that basically became the basis for the Gakudan. It was first at universities. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And an interesting thing is that, um, you know, of course, Tokyo Imperial University, which nowadays is just Tokyo University, um, you know, prestigious school. And so these uniforms were kind of seen as like a, a status symbol, right? Like, you know, the smart, probably, you know, these were kids that had some, you know, money. Um, you know, th- these were the kinds of kids that got to wear these uniforms. And um, they they were modeled after like army uniforms or I think it was army uniforms. Um, so this was a little bit vague, but it seems like the uniforms were modeled after the Japanese army uniforms, and but the Japanese uniforms were modeled after Prussian uniforms. So indirectly, these uniforms, the Gakudan, are kind of modeled after the, the Prussian uniform. Um, and, Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, of course, at the time, it was like a very nationalist time. You know, Japan was getting into different conflicts with, you know, China and whatever in Russia. And so, you know, it, it makes sense that they would go with this kind of military-ish kind of style. Um, but uh, again, you know, it was like the high collar. Um, the first one had gold buttons. I don't know if that's still common today. Do they normally have gold buttons? Shoot. Uh, mine had yeah gold buttons like five okay. gold buttons to the top of you uh, you know to your mm-hmm. neck right 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 yeah uh, i think the original one was colored black and i think for the most part they're still black today maybe sometimes you might get slightly yeah, navy or something but some navy ones but usually yeah. that's all black yeah with gold yeah. buttons yeah Mm-hmm. and slacks and back then they had like these military style like hats like um almost like what you would see well exactly what you would see like a military officer wear you know like it would have the bill and the little part at the top that comes up so nowadays you know kids don't wear the hats anymore they don't that's not part of the uniform but back then yeah for a long time i think they used to wear the hats Mm. um so that was in the in the 1880s and the gakuran i think well oh something else interesting gaku comes from school and then ran comes from rangaku which is like uh, Ran is referring to like the Dutch, the Netherlands, 
because that was really influential in Japan for a long time during the Edo period. And that's a whole other thing. But interesting that even though I, I guess Ran just became a general term for anything Western to some extent. So uh, because this uniform has nothing to do with the Dutch as far as I can tell. So, uh, But yeah, it's a Dutch person Gakuran. once saw it. A Dutch person saw it, so he said, yeah, we'll, we'll call it Gakuran. Yeah. Um, so for the most part, the Gakuran is pretty much the same as, as it was back then. Uh, very similar. Uh, you know, over the years, there's been different trends and stuff in, in male uniforms, whatever. But for the most part, it, it seems like the Gakuran has really remained unchanged for over 100 years. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, during the war... I think there was um, I've seen photos of like kids in the war and they their uniforms looked very military ish. They weren't exactly like Gakuran, but, you know, there were slight differences. And I'm sure depending on which school you went to also, there were somewhat differences. So but again, yeah, for the most part, the Gakuran today is pretty much the same. Um, I think the more interesting story here, though, is with the Seirafuku. So um Ryan, how would you describe Seirafuku? <laughs> uh, the most famous school uniform in Japan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. It yeah, has I think a skirt, Sailor Moon. usually a white shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's exactly what Sailor Moon would wear, right? Yeah, she, yeah. She'd have the, the blue skirt with the white shirt. And then um, usually like a, what do you call that? Like almost like a bib kind of thing. <laughs> And and like a little scarf kind of thing. A yeah, like a little ribbon. Yeah, yeah, and of course there are different versions and all that. The but skirts can the be many part. different colors. It's the only way I can tell my students from the other high schoolers in my city. True. Yeah. The, like sometimes there's a light blue or a darker blue, or there's you know my little students are red here and there. Red. Interesting. Wait, wait, wait. Red. Like a dark red. red yeah. Huh. Is that one yeah. of the ones with? Well, I guess the, it's like a blue the, and a red. The like huh. the like it's plaid, so I guess the base is blue, but like the lines on it are red. Interesting. And we do have one huh. school. I don't know which school it is, but one of them has like a base green because I know they always like stand out when I see them. Huh. Hey. That literally is the yes. only way I can like tell if they're my school or not because yeah. otherwise they're pretty much identical. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Like I remember <laughs> at the junior high that I worked at, you know, it was a pretty standard. It wasn't like a full on sailor uniform. They had like um like an overall kind of like the whole skirt thing would pull over. Like you would, you would put it on a, what do they call it? It's like a jump ascata. I think they call them in Japanese, but anyway, yeah. Um, like different schools would have different color, different variations. So you could pretty quickly tell like what school the kid was from just by looking at, at the, at the girl's uniform, the guy's uniform usually are much more similar. Yeah. That one. I, I have to like, if they look like they recognize me, like, oh, that's probably my student. Otherwise I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone's well, faces maybe, now because everyone's been wearing masks for two years. True. <laughs> and maybe that's like, why, you know, that's the intention of that uniforms, like they're identical. So, well, some kids choose schools for their, their uniforms. Right. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some girls want to wear that cute uniform. That, yeah, that's yeah, why, yeah. you know, they go to this school or that school. And also mm -hmm. it's really good for uh, teachers for example, mm -hmm. I went on a school trip uh, lately, mm -hmm. and uh, I and can you, recognize you are a teacher, my students by the way, so anybody, easily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I teach yeah. English at a uh, junior high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for now. <laughs> for now, yeah. Small little yeah, story yeah. where I'm from. So there's mm – -hmm. I work at three high schools. One doesn't have uniforms. And the other mm -hmm. two are the academic-focused high schools in my city. And mm -hmm. the higher leveled one that most students want to go to is famous for having the worst uniform in the whole city. <laughs> hey. I, I don't know how to explain it. All the kids complain it looks like a junior high uniform. And they uh -huh. look almost the same like the high school and junior high ones. Yet I do agree with them. It looks like more immature than the other ones. What kind of style is that? Uh, sailor Fuku. That uniform. <laughs> a sailor. Ah, uh, sailor Fuku. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I, I think like really traditional stereotypical sailor style is not as popular these days as it as it used to be maybe like 80s 90s but I mean you still see it around the high school is older it's actually like 100 years old so maybe it's mm -hmm. older fashioned which makes it look more immature I don't know 
Could be, could be. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just jump ahead a little bit and then I'll go back to the beginnings of the sailor uniform. But um, from what I understand, in the 80s, um, a lot more schools started using like the blazer style mm. and a lot more schools started trying to be more fashionable in their uniforms. So I think maybe around the 80s, you know, and maybe into the 90s, a lot of schools really started to change uh, their uniforms to attract more students and be a little bit more, you know, cool and fashionable. Um, and so maybe that's really when we start to get a lot of the variation. But I, I'm not clear on all the details, but uh, that's what I, I read a lot more blazers too in the 80s. Oh, by the way, I didn't know that it was uh, the Buddha uniform meant uh, blazer uniform. <laughs> Because in Japanese it's Buddha, so I was like, "What the hell does it does it mean?" Like Buddha. I, I was but the same way. Someone had to explain that to me. Blazer. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, blazer can also sound like some sort of like video game special attack, like <laughs> blazer. fire blazer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buddha. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the the word blazer does exist in English. That's the the, the jacket, right, that you wear on top. But um, I don't know what I would uh, just say jacket, a, though. I would never say blazer. True, true. That That's what I was going to kind of get at next, where I, I don't know what an American school would normally just call that. They would probably just go with jacket. I, I think I agree with Ryan. But yes, that, that is an actual English word, though. So, um, But uh, anyway, yeah, so that, that was mainly in the 80s. Blazer uniforms really started to explode more in, in popularity. But before, let, let's go back to the beginning. So um, before girls had sailor uniforms, um, my understanding is that in the Meiji period, girls started wearing hakama. So they would... To school? Wear... Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the boys... Mm. Um, so in the early days of school, I, I'm not sure if the boys were wearing like slacks and, and, and shirts or a combination of like hakama and, and, but the girls specifically, they, oh no, they, some schools, yeah, they did have a mix. I, I do have a photo in the notes where you see uh, a pair, like a boy and a girl at the same time. One guy is wearing basically the gakuran and the girl, she's wearing like a hakama with a kimono. And I, I guess they were going to, you know, the same school at the same time. I'm looking at that um, picture now. I just got to say with the hat on, he looks like a bus driver. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same guy. <laughs> that's the hat that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Or I, I, I was thinking like a taxi driver, right? <laughs> He's some but, kind of uh, driver. Yeah. 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 I mean, nowadays you only see like, you know, those kinds of people where like maybe like a, a horse and carriage driver or something like that. Right. Um. But uh, anyway, yeah, at the same time around, let's say, like the 1910s, 1900s, early 1900s, girls were wearing hakama and kimono while some boys were wearing, um, you know, gakuran and, and more like Western style uniforms. Um, like every day? But um, not I, only yeah, for special every day at, but yes, every day at some schools. I don't know about every single school, but I, I found specific schools that this was the uniform for a time. Sorry, just a quick correction. So I know I use the word kimono, um, so I don't want to come off like I'm giving the wrong impression here because I highly doubt that it was a proper kimono. Um, if you were to ask a Japanese person, they'd probably tell you it was something else because there are various garments that uh, I guess you would say resemble a proper kimono but are not technically kimono. So just for example, a yukata, like a Japanese person would call that a yukata. They wouldn't normally call it a kimono as far as I understand, but in the West we would just clump them all in as kimono. So um, I guess that was my uh, Western sensibility kind of jumping in there and taking over uh, because I'm pretty sure that the girls from the Meiji period weren't wearing proper kimono and hakama. They were wearing whatever the technical name for it was, but the point remains that it was a kimono-like garment that didn't have, like, buttons or anything like a, a Western shirt would. You know, it's just kind of like one flap over the other, and then they would tie it down, presumably somehow. There's, like, an obi or something, and then they would wear the hakama pants uh, to get around and so that they could move around more easily, like I was saying. So, again, probably not technically a kimono, but, you know, you get the idea. So, apparently, what, what I was reading is... I guess up until then, girls were supposed to wear more like the traditional style, just kimono, not hakama. And hakama, by the way, is basically like uh, pants-ish kind of. <laughs> like mm. they're very flowy, you know, but it's easier to move around in a hakama than just a normal kimono because the kimono is very restrictive. Like you, you can only move your legs like not that much, right? So 
if you're going to school and maybe you have to move around and go to, let's say, if there's some kind of like physical activity, if you're in a restrictive kimono or yukata or something like that, it's very hard for you to do things, even like clean the classroom. So I guess some girls and maybe even schools were in favor of the hakama style. I really uh, want to because... see a group of like old high school girls playing basketball in hakama now. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I, I would I would watch that. Um, but eventually, I guess Hakama, you know, they you know, was still not that practical, right? I mean, compared to, yeah, like, like what you're saying, if you want to play basketball, Hakama is not the best option. <laughs> but here we get into the sailor uniform part. And this is an interesting little like controversy or like um, there's arguments about who the first school was to introduce the sailor uniform. And from what I can tell, the two main contenders are a school in Kyoto and a school in Fukuoka. And there are sources that claim that each was the first one. So I think this this argument will never be decided <laughs> because both will always say, I was the first one. Let's decide it now. But I vote Fukuoka. You vote Fukuoka? Okay. <laughs> Shu? <laughs> but Kyoto used to be the capital of Japan. So you go with Kyoto? <laughs> yeah, that's why I think they're making it up. Uh, like they were ashamed they weren't first, so they tried to like rewrite history. That's my theory. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are they saying that they both introduced the sailor style uniform at around the same time? Yes. Yeah, so I'll tell you the story. Okay. So, so, um, okay. So Kyoto Jogakuin, a uh, girls' school in Kyoto, claims that they introduced the sailor uniform in 1920. Now, I, I put a photo in the notes so that you can see the original version. Um, and it's basically like a one-piece, like, single, like, cut dress. Like, there, it's not a two-piece, like we were saying with the more modern sailor mm. uh, fuku. Sailor clothes. Fuku means clothes, but sailor uniform. So it's a one-piece dress, or in, in Japanese it would be a one-piece. And um, they would use a belt to tighten it around the waist. And uh, you would get, like, a scarf, like, around the, the neck. Um, so it looks sailor uniform ish, but it looks a bit different than, you know, what you most people would think of sailor uniform these days. I do got to say in this photo, she's with a dog. If the uniform mm -hmm. came with a dog, I'm changing my vote to Kyoto. You know, I give me a dog. You have to take the dog to school with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at, at the first day of school, everybody gets their dog. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know about the dog. I, I didn't research that part. Sorry. Um, now, the the other school. Okay. So now we get to Fukuoka. So Fukuoka Jogakuin, an, another girl's school, but this one in Fukuoka. The story is that they implemented the the sailor uniform in 1921, December, if I remember correctly. Um, so we're, we're a little bit after, um, the 1920 introduction over in, in Kyoto, but according to at least one source that I was reading, they began designing it in 1917. <laughs> so I, I don't know if this is something that somebody just said, no, no, but if we say we started designing it before them, then we can take credit. Or if that's actually the truth, I have no idea, but um, the story is that the principal of that school, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Lee, I'm, I'm not clear on where exactly she's from originally, but she apparently did like some kind of exchange study in Britain. So she went uh, to the UK as a young child, as a school child. And at that point, apparently either she saw British Navy officers wearing like the sailor uniforms or there was a, a surge in popularity in children's like fake Navy uniforms <laughs> at the time. I'm going to assume the male British Navy officers were wearing the skirt uniform. <laughs> That's more like, uh, what's that feeling or somewhere? Uh, no, Scotland, in, Scotland. In, yeah, Scotland. Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah, think the it. No, 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 these were definitely not kilts, just skirts. <laughs> just skirts, just skirts. They were very progressive in like mid-1800s uh, UK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very. 
<laughs> so, um, okay. So apparently now I was reading another article that said it was more likely that she saw the kids version because around 1840 something like the Prince of Wales was seen wearing like a kid's Navy uniform and everybody went crazy for it and they thought it was super cute. And so then that led to a surge in popularity in children's like Navy outfits. And so then maybe this Elizabeth Lee woman saw that and then later on based her design of the of the sailor uniform on that i don't know the point is that fukuoka jogakuin claims that elizabeth lee wanted i guess to create some kind of uniform for the girls i guess because of the whole hakama thing and how that was inconvenient and so then she ordered fabric and it took them a while to create these uniforms but by 1921 they implemented into the school and also in 1921 several other schools implemented um basically sailor uniform designs as the school uniform for that school so I she's the one, one to blame for why 100 years later i still have like girl students complaining they can't <laughs> just wear pants <laughs> yeah yeah maybe elizabeth lee or maybe kyoto university i i don't know those are the two top contenders. There are other schools that also started in 1921, but those are the two that get cited the most uh, frequently, both in English and Japanese. A little off topic, and, but for the record, yeah. I do have many students who complain they want to wear pants. <laughs> I, I'm sure you do. Yes, yes. And we will get to that. We will get to that later. But um, one last thing I want to mention on this topic is that um, there's a very well-known school uniform maker called Tombo. T-O-M-B-O-W, I think is how you write it in English, but Tombo in, in Japanese. Um, I think they're one of the biggest school uniform companies. And on their website, they say that there's various theories for which school was the first one to implement the school uniform. So I think they're purposely not taking a, a side and saying that it was Kyoto or Fukuoka. They're saying, you know, people say it was Kyoto, people say it was Fukuoka. So, yeah, we can't say for sure which school it was. But um, I, I'm sure this feud will go on forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> each of these schools wants to be the, the first one. Oh, and, and the Kyoto school on their website, they say that they were the first one. So they're pretty, uh, di- I don't so know. So they are to blame. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. For this maybe, obsolete <laughs> yeah, custom maybe. of uniforms. Well, they take credit for it. They, I guess they say, you know, if you want to blame anybody, blame us. So. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the sailor, like I said, the sailor uniform is still around, but I think it's it's definitely not as popular as it as it used to be. But you still see either very traditional looking sailor uniforms or kind of toned down, slightly less, um, I don't know, stereotypical sailor uniforms. But yeah, they're still around and they're very uh, most iconic style, I think, of the female uniform. But nowadays you see different variations and the blazer as well and all that. So sailor uniform. Um one last thing that I want to bring up here, um, and and Shu already kind of brought it up, uh, but we'll talk about this and then we'll go to the commercial. But is the uh, the second button tradition with the with the boys' uniform? Um, so super famous tradition. Uh, Shu, would would you mind explaining for us what what happens with the second button? Sure. Um, for Gakuran style uniforms, um, um, there are five mm-hmm. buttons. And the second mm-hmm. button from the top mm-hmm. is the nearest button from the heart. Mm-hmm. So at the graduation ceremonies, girls won um, uh, the boys' uh, second buttons. I mean, the girls um, goes toward the boy that she likes and ask mm-hmm. for the second button. And for yeah. your information, my Gakura uniform <laughs> didn't have the second button after the graduation ceremony. <laughs> so that means something. <laughs> and someone thank took you, my you. first one too. So oh, because nice, she, nice. she couldn't get the second one. Nice, nice. I was going to ask you. I had to ask you. So thank you for answering. Um, yeah, you know, when you get like the super, super popular boy, right? Like he'll end up with no buttons at the at the end of the... the Cutting off the, the sleeves right? and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but um yeah super famous you see this in like anime and movies and tv shows and all that stuff um and according to what i was reading depending on the region that that the school is in sometimes like different buttons will have different um meanings and one you might give to your friend and one is to the girl that you like and i don't know different different ways of doing it but for the most part yeah the second button is always the same usually you know it's it's the girl that likes you or whatever you know and then you you give it to them 
Um, and there's different explanations for why it's the second button. Like she said, I think one of the most common ones is that it's close to your heart. So that's why you would give it to the person that likes you or you like. Um, also, there's really? another story. Uh, really? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think boys voluntarily like give out their second buttons. They're hoping someone will ask for it. Well, I, Otherwise, I think you know. if it's if it's a wonderful coincidence that both of you like each other, then <laughs> okay, I want to give it to you. Then it then. works out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, but... <laughs> typically it would be the the girl that goes up and, and asks for the button, right? Yeah, because like at the uh, graduation ceremony and uh, in mm-hmm. junior high school, and uh, yeah, uh, and after the ceremony. Like boys really want some girls to come over and ask right, for right, the right. second button. Otherwise, they look like miserable in front of their parents. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, uh-huh. fortunately, someone asked for it. But yeah, uh-huh. she was asking everyone. So <laughs> oh. yeah, she it means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! She left with like thirty-seven of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I got all their buttons. <laughs> Maybe Suckers. she was a good girl, you know, so that she takes everyone so that they don't have to be ashamed. Yeah, exactly. She wants to make it. everybody feel good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or That's maybe great. there's yeah. one boy she really didn't like. So she asked literally everyone except that one just to, like, make a point. Ooh. <laughs> scary. That's a, yeah, that's a scary. That's a scary strategy there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say some, one other thing. Oh, yeah. One other story that I read was that this tradition started in World War II with like, um, I think, you know, back in the day, um, there was a shortage of military uniforms. So some guys had to go basically in their like school uniforms. And when they would leave off to go to war, you know, one one guy gave like a, a, the girl uh, his second button because, you know, he might not come back or something like that. But I don't think it's it's clear exactly if that's something true or um, that's just, you know, one theory that people say, but um, yeah, let's uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll go talk about those uh, Budama that we started the show off with. Hey, so just a quick reminder, we just started a YouTube channel. It's called Japankyo Docs. So as the name implies, Docs refers to documentaries and we're releasing short documentaries on people in Japan doing interesting things. Uh, there is at least one full episode out now, if not two by the time you're listening to this, or, or maybe there's a lot more if you're listening to this like two years down the road or something. So uh, go check it out. You can find it at japankyo.com slash YT, japankyo.com slash YT, or just look up Japankyo Docs. I'm working on this project with Kyle from the Tokyo Explosion podcast. Kyle uh, has been on this show several times, I think four times. Um, You've heard him in the episode about the Japanese uh, bubble era and uh, that episode where we talked about vegetable themed insults in Japanese and and a couple other ones. Uh, Kyle is just such a funny, talented, uh, and just really nice guy. I love working with him, and uh, it's, it's really been an honor to, to get to collaborate on this project with him. Um, he's also just amazing with the camera and video editing, um, and I help out behind the scenes. I try to find the people and, and you know, think up uh, like what we can do, how we can do it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the logistics guy in the background, but we've also gotten a lot of help from Zach from the Tokyo Explosion podcast, um, Kyle's wife, <laughs> and uh, also, Chris from Mondo Mascots, the very popular uh, Twitter account uh, where they introduce Japanese mascots to the world. It, it's, it's a great Twitter account. If you're not following, you you definitely should. But Chris recommended um, the subject of our first full length video, uh, Koronon, to us. So Koronon is this very cute cat mascot that uh, is helping fight the spread of the coronavirus. So it, it's a really fun video. We've gotten some great reactions. People have been super positive about it. So if you haven't already, go subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the notification bell hit the like button leave some comments spread the word about the videos because well that helps uh, youtube realize that this is content that people actually enjoy so once youtube realizes that then youtube starts to push the videos for us and then the channel actually sees some significant growth so help us make that happen so that we can keep bringing you more content like that all right and uh, don't forget to check out the latest episode of japan station because that episode is just me and kyle talking about kind of the creation of this youtube channel and the behind the scenes 
stuff, like some funny stories uh, involving some hypothetical corpses in a, a rural part of Tokyo, um, the filming of the Pompadour video, and, and a couple other things. So go check that out. That's episode 78 of Japan Station. You can find it at japanstationpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and follow on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram at Japankyo News. All right, so let's get back into the rest of the episode. All right, so let's talk about uh, Budama. And Budama is a Japanese term, obviously, and I, I don't think there's a, a very succinct, easy to understand English term for what exactly a Budama is, right? Like, I, I can't think of anything good. So I don't know. Ryan, can you think of anything good? <laughs> no. No, yeah, it's basically this Japanese thing. Um, you could, you know, and, and I will in the show notes, I'm just going to write bloomers. But bloomers are, are actually, if you were to ask somebody in the US that knows nothing about Japan and you tell them bloomers, you might get the answer that we're talking about like really old fashioned big underwear, like something like a, a grandma from, I don't know, 1940 would wear. So uh, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> So it's tricky. It's just Budama is Budama. So that that's we're just gonna mainly stick to that. But um yeah, Budama, let, let's see. It's basically the girls PE uniform shorts that was popular um from like around the 1960s to early 1990s. And they are like super Super short shorts. All, they almost look like underwear. And, you know, like basically part of your butt is, is pretty much hanging out. Like they're, they're very, very short. Um, yeah, I think by the time that you were in school, Shu, like these were not common anymore, right? No, no, not at all. I have never seen the yeah. real ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everybody dreams to see one. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. These are <laughs> basically like Budama have become something that exists only in like sexy media <laughs> let's put it that way that's right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> they've disappeared from common um school life from yeah but they are still very well known and and yeah they exist in media still um you know like porn and whatnot and that kind of stuff but um if you do a, a search for budama on google and google images you're gonna get a bunch of girls butts in budama so just to let you guys know so <laughs> But why why were junior high and high school girls in Japan wearing such like basically basically underwear to exercise in? Like this is something that baffles like the mind. It's just like why? Why were they doing this? Because men and, designed the standards? <clears throat> well, okay, and Ryan. Those you, were you, teachers? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. That that is the short answer. Yes. <laughs> that is exactly the short answer, yes. Yeah, you, yeah. No, I, I was referring more to the history, but um, that's that, the that answer. Is the we can try that. Yeah, it is. Like it's it's not. One is students. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, Two. The, the the more complicated answer is that there was some money involved and blah blah blah. Now, I'll get into that. But when you talk to, let's say, um, uh, girls that are maybe like a little bit older than uh, I think even Ryan and I, or maybe barely our age, you know, and girls that went through this. Um, you know, in junior high or high school, uh, you know, I, I've never met a girl that said, I, I miss Budaba. <laughs> like, it's always like, oh my God, I always hated wearing Budaba. It's like, <laughs> they always complain about them whenever this comes up in any sort of conversation that I've had with them. And I don't know how many times this has been, but it's been a handful of times that for whatever reason we started talking about Budaba. Um, yeah, so widely girls did not like Budaba. So and the guys did, right? The guys loved them, of course. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, and that's just that's just how these things are, of course. Um, but yeah, so so what happened? Like, why did Japan all of a sudden, for like maybe thirty-ish years, use Budama across the nation, and then all of a sudden they disappeared? So a couple of years ago, somebody sent me this article and th this article has been in my mind for years now. And then I think this is what sparked the idea to do this episode. But um, it was an article about a professor from Kansai University. Um, his last name was Yamamoto. I can't remember his first name. But in around 2017, he published a book that was called like the the mystery of the Burma, right? But in Japanese, it was like Burma no Nazo, I think it was called. 
And he did research to find out, like, what happened? Like, why did it become super popular? And then why did it disappear all of a sudden? And the story begins um, in 1964 with the Tokyo Olympics. Now, most people used to say, apparently, he called this a Toshi Densetsu, so an urban legend, that when people would be asked, like, oh, why are Burma so, like, widely used popular you know the common answer was oh because in 1964 the women's volleyball team they they won against the ussr the gold medal and they were wearing budama at the time so the, the budama became very popular but that's not true and i found a video of the finals of the volleyball from 1964 um on youtube wonderful wonderful youtube um you know i watched it and i did not see any budama on the women's um lower body <laughs> hey, so that was just an excuse <laughs> yeah so someone. i don't know yeah i have no idea who said this first but that is what many people <laughs> apparently think that's the pervert <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the, yes that was the guy that started it all <laughs> and maybe the the one who uh wrote the book was the uh-huh. first no perverted uh teacher yeah, yeah. <laughs> he stopped it. <laughs> yeah. That's the he's reason the first... why they don't wear <laughs> Burma anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's the first guy to check the video and go like, hmm, that's not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, then yeah, he I watched was the video. blamed by everyone, right? Every other yeah, teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I will include the video in case anybody wants to check the video for themselves. But, you know, they're wearing, you know, short shorts, but these are not Burma. These are just, you know, kind of athletic shorts. Um, so that's not true. So then what happened? Why did these Burma become so popular? Well, apparently, I think it was around 1965, we, we get the beginning of, of the, <laughs> what happens where schools start to implement, um, the Burma. So the, this, this quote unquote federation, I guess it was like an organization somewhat either associated to the government or the board of education or the ministry of education. I'm not clear on the details, but it's called the Chu Taiden for short. It's the junior high physical education federation. That's how I translated it. Um, They needed money to sponsor events around the country. And so uh, Ozaki Shoji was the name of the company, I believe at the time. Now they're called um, Kanko and they are a manufacturer Ah, hmm. Of very well known, right? A manufacturer of like school uniforms. Yeah, um, uh, along with uh, Tombow. Yeah, they're those mm-hmm. are two uh, biggest uh, uniform companies in Japan, I guess. Right, yeah. and so I think at the time they were using a different name, and I think that was Ozaki Shoji. But anyway, now they're known as Kanko. Uh, so Ozaki Shoji or this company approaches the Junior High Physical Education Federation and says, like, "Hey, we'll give you some money." You know, so that you can keep sponsoring your events, but in exchange, you got to give us some privileges. You know, you got to say that we're like an official supplier and, you know, this and that. And you make us an exclusive distributor of school like supplies and and, like clothing and that kind of thing. And so the, the Federation agrees and they strike this deal and some money gets exchanged. And so then this company starts to use this as a marketing strategy to get schools that were not using Burma, which was pretty much every school. Nobody was using Burma at the time. And, and, oh, oh. And one thing that I should mention is that the, there was an effort to get the women's volleyball team from 1964 to wear Burma, but they said that was too embarrassing. We don't want to do it according to this, this professor. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. yeah, instead, yeah. Make students wear this. Yeah. Instead make underage <laughs> girls wear them. Yes. Yeah. Junior <laughs> high school students. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> These uh, people are gross. Yeah. So gross. So the, yeah, the, it is. Yeah. So the 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 uniform company sees this gap in the market, right? It's like, look, we can make all these schools across Japan buy this new type of uniform. The and gap make a whole due to of lack money. of demand. <laughs> Yeah, due to lack of demand. <laughs> Nobody wants it, but now we can force them to make it. Um, well, they Seriously? couldn't force it, but. Wow. Yeah, but but they had this leverage, right? They had the influence of the Chu Taiden, the the federation, right? Uh, so, within the span of what, like ten years, Ryan? Do you see the statistics? Uh, I I highlighted them. from the twelve percent to seventy six percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from okay, nineteen sixty five to years? the first mm-hmm. half of the seventies, so about ten years. 
Yeah. So they went from what, like 1965 was like 12% all the way up until like 75%. 76%. Like 76%. Yeah. And other manufacturers also got in on this and they started selling the Budama. So within roughly 10 years, three fourths of Japanese schools. And I, I don't know if this is junior high, high school or both. The, the article was not clear, but most of, or at least a whole lot of Japanese schools started using Budama all of a sudden within like 10 years. And I guess these companies made a whole bunch of money. So, so they got to exploit young girls and make money. How great. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's what this country is all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that's why if you watch anime or like media from the 80s or 90, 90s less so, but like I would say 70s and 80s. And if it's like a school show or something, you know, you're going to see girls wearing the Budama. Um, yeah, that's super, super, super common. So just so you guys know. But um, by by the early 90s, something happens yeah and and more and more uh people are kind of like saying like oh this has become a sexualized thing and it started more that and more way people yeah basically <laughs> but finally. you know more and more <laughs> yeah finally people are becoming more vocal but there's a really um important kind of pivotal incident that happens in 1993 so in singapore there's a nihonjin gakko which is one of these schools that exist outside of japan that are for uh japanese students uh so that they can keep like let's say their parents are like uh diplomats or at a at an embassy or something or at at some sort of foreign company and they want their students their kids to still go to a japanese style school so that when they go back to japan they can just jump right back into the education system there's these schools in different countries right like in singapore so in singapore in 1993 it used to be that female students were allowed to wear whatever they wanted like they i guess they had maybe like longer shorts maybe like long pants like the jaji style and there was some freedom in choice but then there was i think it was a school principal or or maybe the the pe teacher i don't remember exactly who but somebody decided nope all the girls have to wear burma and <laughs> and so now when the girls would go running outside of the school like maybe for track and field or for PE, you know, maybe they were practicing like marathon or something, you know, running outside, you know, the girls started complaining that people would stare at them in the streets, right? Because they were wearing these tiny, tiny shorts. And so then, um, the, and Asahi there's news... no perverted culture in Singapore, like Japan no, did, right? <laughs> no, of course not. No, they, they were just looking at, at their hair. They weren't looking at anything else. They were not, they were no perverts in Singapore. So, um, yeah, so, they will uh, find it uh, crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So of course the girls are feeling uncomfortable, right? These are like probably junior high, high school girls. And they're getting like people on the street staring at them because they're running around in shorts that their butts are hanging out. Of course they're uncomfortable. <laughs> so, um, so Eventually, Asahi newspaper runs a story on this, and I guess this becomes like, you know, really big and probably the TV channels pick it up. And I guess it becomes like a really big story. And so from there, I guess that was the last kind of nail in the coffin for the Budama. From there, it seems like whatever schools were still using it at the time really started to phase it out. And like I said, nowadays, you do not see Budama in schools at all. Good riddance. Yeah, good riddance. Exactly, exactly. But um yeah, this, this whole idea of of um, having girls wear, you know, something super skimpy, either, even though the boys don't have to, is certainly not something that's gone away. Um, in the, you know, 2020 Tokyo Olympics, there was a whole story. I think it was the Norway volleyball team or the, the I forget it was which exact, I think it was a volleyball team, but they were complaining about having to wear really, really short shorts when the men's were wearing like just normal shorts, but this was a rule that they had to wear these super short shorts. And so they had no freedom of choice. So just, you know, to be 100% clear, not a uniquely Japanese thing, but you know, this is a certainly a, a very um, memorable part of Japanese society of like from 60s to the nineties. Um, so yeah, so that, that is Burma and, uh, Again, you don't see them outside of um, the kind of sexy stuff these days. But um, one last thing that I, I want to touch on before we close out is this whole idea of, you know, freedom of choice with the uniform and quote unquote genderless uniforms. Um, this past year, like from 2020 to um, starting for this, uh, yeah, this most recent school year, 
Um, I've seen several stories talk about schools implementing um, choice for uh, girls, especially where they can wear slacks. Or I even remember reading a story where there was a school in Japan, I think, that boys could even choose to wear skirts if they wanted to. Um, so I, I don't think this is like a nationwide, you know, like super, super big trend, but I have seen, I don't know, at least five or six different stories, um, at different schools in Japan where there's a lot more freedom these days where girls can switch uniforms. So I think we're at the very beginnings of bigger change, but still very much the the beginning. So good sign, but still a long way to go. Um, have, yeah, my school you heard- started allowing mm-hmm. uh, girls to wear um, slots if they yeah. want. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That is good. Yeah, Mine so, does not. Yeah. Okay, okay. So oh, really? little by little. Mm-hmm. There's actually little some little. girls at my, the one school that doesn't have uniforms that say specifically they went there because they didn't want to have to wear skirts. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, like, I mean, it, it's pretty um, tough if, you know, you're in a very cold part of japan which i mean yeah most places in japan do get fairly cold in the in the winter um hokkaido is a whole different story and tohoku and all that but 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 for the most part you know like most places in japan do get cold enough in the winter where you know wearing a skirt would probably be uncomfortable (laughs) that's another thing yeah yeah Yeah. they're forced to wear them Mm -hmm. still in 2020 Yeah. yeah 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 Like another aspect of of the whole school uniform thing is the the whole idea of koromogae, right? Which is these these periods in 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 the calendar, I guess, this day where it's like, okay, now we're all switching to the winter uniform. It's like now we're all switching to the summer Mm -hmm, uniform. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But weather is not predictable, especially with more extreme weather conditions lately. Um, You know, there's certainly times when um at least when i was teaching in japan where it's like okay we switched to the winter but it's still super hot or we switched to the you know winter or we switched to the summer but it's still very cold or something you know so it's it's very tricky and and i don't know like shoot do you know like is there some like adjustment with the some flexibility with that schedule or is it usually just like we all do it on one day and that's it there was until last year Mm-hmm. So there was a, a period of time, a short period of time where, you know, they can wear either. But mm-hmm. after the period, they have to all wear the same thing, like summer clothes or winter clothes. But now mm-hmm. it's more flexible. You know, they can wear like um, summer clothes in the winter if, you know, they don't, if they mm-hmm. don't want to wear the hot clothes in the mm-hmm. winter. So okay, it's okay. more flexible right now. Oh, that's good. But yeah, when I was a student, I was, yeah, there was this period of time where you have to you know, change from summer clothes to winter clothes. And mm-hmm. in winter, uh, no, in spring, uh, there is this uh, two week period where, you know, you can wear e- either one, but after that, you have to switch to the mm. um, summer clothes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think, yeah, I remember there being kind of a little bit of a transition period when I was teaching at my school. Over. There's also, for the full uniform, the top part, there's like a shirt, a sweater, and the blazer. And mm-hmm. depending on the weather, they're allowed to wear any number of those. So if they're cold, they wear all three. If they're not cold, they can wear only two or only the shirt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, that, that's pretty much it. Um, anything else you want to add, Ryan? Or are we. No, I'm good. good? All right. Um, Shu, well, thank you so much again for, for joining us. We love having you on. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah it was really informative. And yeah. it was really, yeah. So so now you know now you know the controversy about sailor uh, uniforms and why Burma appeared and disappeared so quickly. So there you go. Now you can tell all your Japanese friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was this pervert who <laughs> wanted to spread the Burma style. <laughs> and he also got a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. All right, well, thank you guys. See you next time. See ya.